Okay, welcome to chapter 11, where we'll be talking about sexual communication. So talking about sex is actually one of the most difficult things to do. Uh, people don't feel comfortable communicating their sexual needs and desires. In fact, a lot of times they don't even want to talk about sex at all. And many couples will engage in intercourse without ever having discussed anything about intercourse, um, including their sexual history, <clears throat> excuse me, sexual preferences, um, how they feel about safe sex and practicing safe sex, etc. This is primarily because we're not taught to talk about sex or issues associated with sex. It isn't something that you hear people do on a regular basis. Most of the time on TV shows or movies, you'll just see couples meet. They're attracted to each other. The next thing you know, they're in bed naked. Um, and you kind of wonder, well, how did we get there? And they don't typically talk about it. They just do it, which gives us the impression that that's what's supposed to happen. But in order to have a healthy sexual relationship or even a healthy relationship with your partner, you do have to communicate about sex. And it actually should take place prior to jumping into bed naked with one another. And so you should have some idea of how you want to communicate to a potential partner about safe sex, for example. And I'm actually going to post a handout on web, um, not WebCT, it's not WebCT anymore, on D2L regarding how to talk to a partner about using a condom. It is something that most women don't feel comfortable with. Men aren't sure if their female partners are comfortable with it. Um, and even though you'd think after HIV in this day and age that all couples that don't know each other's sexual history and haven't been tested would engage in safe sex, but that's actually not accurate. And people feel like if they ask, um, women in particular, if they ask, they must be asking for sex and must be promiscuous. But actually men report they're relieved if women bring it up because they're not sure how to bring it up either. So some of the barriers to sexual communication include the failure to initiate. So which should, you know, which partner should initiate? And that's difficult. Actually, both partners should be willing to initiate. If you're willing to engage in adult sexual behavior, you should be willing to initiate a conversation about it. Um, another barrier, feeling like this is, this is not the time and the place. Well, sometimes it is the only time and place. Just like in the movies, one might meet a potential partner, become attracted to somebody while they're out in a bar um, or while they're at a party, and there really is no other time to discuss things. And so it can be important. It could even be a hypothetical way of communicating with your potential partner. Like, say um, you were going to hook up with somebody. Would you, would you insist on using condoms? Um, <clears throat> would you be willing to talk about, you know, what turns you on and what doesn't? It could be kind of a fun conversation starter, depending on how you approach it. The lack of specificity is a third barrier, so not being specific about the topics. Being vague is not helpful. It is important to be specific. Um, another huge problem, in my opinion, is number four, failing to listen in an active way. And so most of the time, people, when they're in a conversation with somebody, they're so focused on what they're going to say next that they don't even hear what the person has said to them. And that is a problem when it comes to sexual communication too. It can be uncomfortable to talk about. And when we're in those types of situations, we tend to think, how the heck am I going to respond to this? I don't even know what to say. Um, it's much more important that you listen and pay attention to what your partner is saying and then formulate a response. And it's okay to say, you know what? I really need to think about that for a second. I was listening to you so intently that I haven't even formulated a response yet. So just give me a second. It's perfectly okay to do that. A lack of assertiveness, more common among women, 
um, is another barrier. So not feeling like they can be assertive in the relationship and even start a conversation about sex, that it's not appropriate. Um, when I say it's always appropriate. Um, and then the miscommunication, goodness. So saying yes when we mean no. <clears throat> and sometimes that can even be interpreted as some sort of sexual game. So do you really mean it yes? Or are you really not in the mood? Um, does no mean no? What are you talking about here? If you're open and honest with a partner and communicate what you like and don't like, what you're comfortable with and what you're not comfortable with, what you're willing to do and what you're not willing to do, then that's going to make it much easier to say, no, I'm really not comfortable with this. If you communicate to your partner that maybe um, anal intercourse is off, off, the, off limits, not going to happen. So that way, if you are getting hot and heavy in, in the thick of things, and it seems to be leading towards that, you can then say, remember we talked about this, I'm not comfortable. So that leads me into number seven, which is failing to make requests. So not only should you communicate with what you're not comfortable with, but if you are engaged in sexual play or behavior with a partner and they're not doing anything at all that you enjoy, maybe you need nipple stimulation, for example, or maybe you need direct pressure on the clitoris, or maybe you need more pressure when someone's stroking your penis. Um, you have to communicate that in order to have a sexually satisfying experience. Oftentimes, an easy way to do this is to show them. If you're not comfortable speaking the words, you can take their hand and show them. Um, and that shouldn't be something that the other partner should feel offended about. Like, wow, I wasn't doing what you liked. Um, but you could say, you know what? This really excites me when you do this. And then just show them, take their hand. It can actually be quite stimulating and exciting to the sex play. So in general, there are actually some miscommunications that happen between men and women due to how men and women are socialized about sex. So first of all, there are disagreements about when sex should occur. So men are much more likely to assume or want sex to take place earlier than women. But it can be the other way around. And if you're with the same sex partner, <laughs> then there is no one man or female, the male or female that's going to take over and decide when it should take place. Um, so oftentimes you'll see same sex partners don't have these type of issues. Uh, men may also be skeptical, skeptical about women's refusals because of the way we're socialized about sex. So that women are taught they're supposed to be demure, say no, um, that they're, they're never supposed to enjoy sex. And so, unfortunately, that may lead to men interpreting the word no um, and even any actions that speak no without the voice command um, as not as just part of a game. And that's why it's important to always be clear and specific with your partner. If you do say no, mean no. If you say yes, mean yes. Communicate what's okay and what's not okay. Number three, because sexual communication is indirect or tends to be, um, women may be unclear in signaling their disinterest. And so men oftentimes miss that sign or that signal. And then finally, men are more likely than women to interpret non-sexual behavior as sexual or a cue. So men are far more likely to interpret someone touching them during conversation as some type of sexual act, even if it's not meant to be. And so that can lead to, of course, misunderstandings and potential problems, which is again why you have to be open and honest and specific in the very beginning. However, it's not too late to be open and honest and specific. You could even use the excuse, I've learned in my sex ed class, if you have a partner, current partner, and start talking now. It's not too late. Um, when it comes to culture and communication, the United States is very culturally diverse and people travel more often today than ever before. So you can find yourself in different um, countries, 
different parts of, of your own country um, where you may run into cultural differences. And they can even occur when there aren't language differences. So just because somebody speaks the same language as you doesn't mean that your communication is going to be exactly the same. So for example, um, in the Chinese culture, it's completely acceptable and normal to see two females walking down the street holding hands when they're just friends or sisters. This is not so common in the United States, and oftentimes it's interpreted as some type of sexual relationship. So that could be misinterpreted, depending on where you are. Um, the American culture is much more direct in communication. The Japanese are very indirect in their communication. Um, the Greek culture can assume that a question is actually a request and react accordingly. And in India, if you compliment the culture um, in India, if you compliment somebody in an item, item, it communicates to them that you want it. Um, so you might find yourself in a situation if you are among individuals from India or you're in India and you compliment somebody, say, on a necklace or a shirt or a lamp, um, you may find that they give it to you. Again, because that's common in that culture. So what do you do that? Um, here are some suggestions. I'll let you read through them on your own. Uh, but these are just some ideas or ways that you can avoid misunderstandings when you have a partner from a different culture. Or even when you just work with people from different cultures, you still want to be open and honest and you don't want to be ethnocentric, which means that you think your own ethnicity is the only right ethnicity. There is no right ethnicity. You're just, you're in, you're born into whatever ethnic culture you are. And everybody thinks their own ethnicity is the, is the right way. Um, so it's important to be open, mindful, and non-judgmental. Relationship conflict. This is probably something I get the most questions on when it come to, comes to communication. Um, healthy conflict, conflict resolution can be easy to understand let's say for test purposes, or even explaining to somebody. But it can be very difficult to apply in the heat of the moment. What I want to say to that is that it, you have to be committed to engaging in healthy conflict resolution. It takes practice, and you have to know what the skills are, learn them, and use them. And it may feel silly at first, but healthy conflict resolution benefits both of you. And so you're trying to come to a compromise that is the best for us, not for me. And that, like I said, can be difficult in the heat of the moment. But if you do, if you are committed, you know it's important, you realize that this is the way conflict should be care. I mean, you can't avoid conflict. It's going to happen. So learn how to handle it in a healthy way. Practice it. Be committed to it. Have a, a list of rules if necessary. And if one partner violates those rules in the heat of the moment, stop the conflict and say, okay, this is one of the rules we've discussed. We're not going to call each other names. Um, so I think we need to take a break you know, before we continue with this conversation or this conflict. And if you do that in a respectful way, instead of trying to hurt your partner, like, look, you just called me a name. That's not allowed. And now I'm pissed because you called me a name. Um, you don't want to use it against your partner. You just want to understand that there are rules that you guys are supposed to respect in order to protect each other and yourself. So the stages, there are six. Again, you have to practice. So I may sound funny now. You may be thinking, "There's we're not going to do that in the heat of the moment. But you'd be surprised that if you practice and you're committed to it, it can actually happen. You want to identify the real problem or the real issue. So sometimes you can be um, engaged in an argument about something that really, maybe you're arguing about the dishes. 
but really has nothing to do with the dishes. It really is more about the distribution of household labor. So maybe you feel like you're always having to do everything. You're doing the dishes this time, and this just kind of has reached its peak, and you're angry. You want to identify that the real issue is the distribution of labor in the house, not the dishes. So that can take a minute. You may even have to say to your partner, we really need to talk about what, what is the real issue here, because it's probably not about what has sparked the argument. <clears throat> The second stage is to identify solutions. Um, There can be a number, so one one of you can do all the housework, or um, you could come up with a chore list, or you could take turns. One week on odd days, it's your day to do dishes. On even days, it's your partner's. Number three, of course, you want to evaluate those and eliminate any that are completely ridiculous or unacceptable to you. So maybe you doing all the housework is just not a viable alternative, so get rid of it. Number four, pick the best one. Remember, you're picking what's best for us, not what's best for me. So thinking about the best solution and talking about it. Number five, you're going to try to implement that solution. Now, part of number five, an important part of number five is number six. You have to follow up on that evaluation. I mean, I'm sorry, solution. So you need to ask each other, is this really working? Did we forget something? Did we forget to take this under account? Um, Is there a better way we can handle this? And of course you want to try to do that when you're not angry. (laughs) The best way to do an evaluation is when you're both calm, cool, and collected. Part of... Engaging in healthy conflict is engaging in active listening. So the best way to know if you're doing this is if you can indicate to the person what they just said. If you can't summarize what you've heard and the feelings you've identified them, whether they state them or not, maybe you you can tell they're sad or they're angry, um, you're not doing your job, which is listening. And this is actually critical to every aspect of life, not just with relationships. So we're talking about it in the context of sexual relationships, but really active listening is critical with everyone. So you have to watch their body language. You have to listen to the tone they're using. You have to try to identify what they're feeling. You want to validate their feelings. You want to say things like, wow, that sounds like you're really frustrated with that. Um, And you want to be able to summarize what they said to you. That doesn't mean you repeat word for word exactly what they just said, but it could be something to the effect of, so I understand you're frustrated because it feels like I'm always leaving all the dishes for you. And you know, that's, you're not coming to a solution. You're not saying whether it's right or wrong. You're just indicating what you heard. And you give your partner a chance to confirm or deny, no, that's not what I meant. Or, wow, yeah, that is what I mean. Don't be so focused on what you're going to say that you can't even hear. And again, this takes practice. You can't just decide one day you're going to do this and think it's just going to come easy. The best way to practice it is to do it with other people. So that when you're with your partner, you've had some experience doing it with others and you're more comfortable doing it. You don't feel as awkward. Um, so I give this in class when we have, in, you know, it's not an internet class. And I, I just want them to think of a time when they really were feeling sad or overwhelmed or they were excited, um, maybe even angry, something, you know, where the feelings were very intense. You know, who did you choose to talk to? And what qualities did that person have that made you decide they'd be a good listener? And then how did it feel if they did listen to you? How did you feel? And I, I even go further with my students and ask, was there any kind of solution? Usually they say, no, I just needed to talk about it. And it's very surprising how healthy that can feel and how healing that can feel. And it can feel good for the listener too, just to listen and confirm what they heard. Um, basically everybody wins. So remember that feeling 
when you're listening to somebody, remember how it feels to be listened to and that that can be helpful in and of itself. Don't be so caught up in, wow, I've got to solve this for them. What am I going to tell them to do? Um, A lot of times what I say to people is, well, what do you think you should do? You know, what solutions come to mind? Have you thought about this? Um, And if they say, no, I, I got nothing. Okay, that's fine. But maybe, you know, might be helpful to think about. It doesn't mean you're telling them you've got to go think about it or trying to solve it. You're just listening. Part of communication, though, of course, is talking. <laughs> communication isn't just listening. It's a big part of it, but that's not the whole point. So we talk about I statements a lot in FCS. And really, it's just a way to express your thoughts and feelings without trying to make the other person feel defensive. Like everything else, it takes practice. And I have to be honest, it feels pretty hokey at first when you start using I statements and you've never used them before. <coughs> People might even ask you, what, what, are, you, what are you doing? Um, but it does, over time, it gets more natural. And you start to find you use it in other contexts, not just with your partner. Um, I use it in work meetings, faculty meetings. I might say, well, I feel kind of picked on when we talk about um, how we're teaching sex ed in this department. I'm one of the people that teaches sex ed. And it, I just feel like I'm being criticized. You know, that's a way to communicate to my coworkers that I do feel picked on, criticized. And so then maybe they'll change the way that they talk about it. And we could talk about it in a way where it's really more constructive criticism or ways to improve rather than just saying, this isn't working. The sex ed teacher shouldn't do this. Okay, well, you know, I feel picked on when we talk like that. And you can even give examples. Um, and another way you can use I statements is to assert what you'd like to see happen, but you don't want to make the other person feel like they have to do it or that don't make them feel defensive in any way. So think about how it would sound to you. You might say to your partner, you know, I'd really like for us to talk about the division of household labor, or if that feels weird, (laughs) talk about chores, um, in a time, at a time when we're not fighting so we can figure this out. You know, that's not going to make the other person feel like, what? Where you might, if you tried to hurt them or you're trying to make them feel defensive, um, you always bring this up when we're fighting. Okay, well, that's going to make somebody feel that they're being picked on and they're not going to be able to engage in a healthy conflict with you if they feel picked on. Um, So just think of I statements as I feel, I would like, I think... But don't use sneaky I statements where is where you're trying to really <laughs> turn it back on the person. I feel like you're trying to make me feel guilty. No, that's a way that's that's a you statement in disguise. So I feel guilty when we talk about money. Not I feel like you're trying to make me feel guilty when we talk about money. Or I feel like you're saying I spend too much. No you statement. Use the I statement. I feel like I maybe I spend too much. I'm not sure that's what is being said here, but that's the message I'm getting. You know, it's always focused on you. But it does take practice, I'm not going to lie. And it does take time. I've reached a point in my life where now I can do it without feeling hokey. But it did take practice. Some mistakes... Um, being too invested in getting your way, you know, step outside the situation for a moment and think about what am I trying to do here? Am I focused on the we or am I focused on the me? Um, Forgetting that there are a number of ways to do things. My advisor always used to say in grad school, there are a number of ways to skin a cat. And although that was kind of a disgusting saying and I love cats and it upset me, (laughs) I knew what he was trying to say. There isn't just one way. So there are several solutions to different types of issues. You just have to figure out which one's the most viable to both of you. What's going to benefit the we, not just the me. Focusing too much on what you could lose and not on what you both could gain is another mistake. So if you're just so worried about losing ground, 
that you can't even communicate with your partner equally. You can't even hear what they're saying. You're just thinking, oh my God, I'm not going to be able to go shopping anymore. Well, that's not really what you should be focusing on. You should be focusing on how can we resolve this where we're both happy? What's the best for we, not me? Um, Because you want the relationship to last, right? I mean, that's the whole point. You're not trying to get out of it. You're trying to improve it. Another, what I, I call this fighting dirty, bringing in other issues before resolving the one that you're already dealing with. Um, this is tied closely to number five, which is bringing in past issues that were supposed to have been <laughs> resolved. So you must not have felt that they were resolved if you're bringing them in to the next fight. Um, and that has to be a rule, just like, you know, no name, I'm not, we're not going to engage in name calling and we can't bring in past issues. And you may find that you're in a place where you have to call your partner on that. And that's okay as long as you do it in a non-defensive or upsetting way. Um, I thought that we agreed we weren't going to bring up past issues. Um, I'm not feeling comfortable right now because we're talking about more than one issue. I would like to just focus on the one that we started. Focus on the we, not on the me. (coughs) Sorry for coughing. Um, consistent with what I've been, the messages I've been giving you so far, you do have to decide on rules before conflict ever begins. So some rules that my partner and I engage in, no name calling, and that you can't use sneaky ways either, like you're acting like a bitch. Um, that's still name calling, you're just trying to be sneaky about it. No stonewalling, meaning refusing to talk about something. No running away, and that doesn't mean like packing your bag, running away. Um, That can mean leaving the room when you're not wanting to talk about something. Um, You have to agree to see the conflict through or to ask for a break. No violence, no blaming, um, and whatever other rules that you want to follow. You both have to come up with them, though, and you both have to agree that they always have to be followed. You're allowed to take a break. But you don't want to take too long of a break because if you take too long, sometimes one of you can just give in and say, I don't even want to fight anymore. Let's just move on. So you only want to take a break for at the most an hour or so. That way you can cool down and really think about, you know, have rules been broken? Where are we going with this? Etc. Practice I statements, active listening all the time, not just with your partner and not just during conflict so it doesn't feel hokey.